So can we start? Yes. So hello everyone. It's my pleasure as a Dean of the Chemistry Department to introduce the speakers of today's roundtable discussion that is called Modern Trends in Chemistry, uh, Theory in its Experiment. Uh, my name is Stefan Kalnikov, so uh, I am by the trainee, I am the radio chemist and nuclear chemist, and now I'm much more involved in a lot of administrative things since two years now. And um, I would like to say a few words that uh, this year we have our anniversary 15th uh, science festival uh, that is thought to be really a very broad uh, uh, scientific event that is always take place in October. And certainly this year, most of the activities, I would say all the activities are online due to all the uh, COVID uh, situation in uh, Russia and in all the countries. Uh, so I would like to even, I would like to say a few words about uh, these challenges that you know that all the sciences, uh, all the, from all the countries, including Moscow State University, including Russia, they, the common science is based on the collaboration between uh, scientists from different countries. This is the very important thing in basic, in basic science. And the main challenge that we, uh, that we face now is that this collaboration is uh, limited to only some online events. And this is very important that all the travel that is very important for scientists, all the uh, join uh, events like uh, conferences, uh, they are only online. And you certainly know, all know that one of the most important thing is the informal uh, communication between scientists. That is always taking place during the coffee breaks, farewell parties, and during uh, all these informal excursions during the conferences. So unfortunately, all the paradigm of the international collaboration is changing. So I really feel that we overcome all these difficulties and we will come back again to normal life where we can meet each other uh, at conferences, at different workshop events, etc. So for us, this is really a challenge because uh, many, uh, many uh, laboratories, many professors in Moscow State Universities, they are collaborating a lot with many universities uh, abroad in Europe, in Asia, in the United States, and this is really a challenge for us. So. That's why I wish, first of all, good health for everyone who is listening to us and to the participants of this roundtable discussion. So before uh, going with the presentations, we have at least four presentations during this, uh, during this roundtable discussion. I would like to have a brief introduction of our main participants. Uh, so it's Maria Zverova, who is the Deputy Dean for Science and Research of chemistry department of Lomonosov Moscow State University. She is present here. Alexander Kabanov, uh, distinguished professor uh, in, um, uh, I'm, I'm happy to tell you that uh, two, uh, uh, two affiliations. One is uh, Chapel Hill in the United States, University of Chapel Hill, and other one chemistry department. So he was one of the first who win the so-called mega grant for establishing a laboratory here in Moscow State University, and he graduated Moscow State University. Uh, we have Lars Anderson, Department of Physics Astronomy uh, from Denmark, uh, Aarhus University. We have Helen Fielding, Professor, Department of Chemistry, University College London, United U UK. We have uh, Jan Verlet, Department of Chemis Chemistry in Durham University, United Kingdom. And we have Anastasia Bichankova, who is associate professor from Department of Chemistry of Moscow State University. So not to take a lot of time for the introduction, I would like to give the floor to uh, Alexander Sasha Kabanov for the first talk. Please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a tremendous pleasure to connect through the ocean uh, with all you guys across uh, Europe and uh, Russia and um, it's 8 a.m. here, so we have some time difference. What I'll do, I will share my screen. Um, let me see. 
Can you see my screen now? Yes, we can see the screen. Okay. And I have a, a relatively short presentation. I was um, told or I was asked uh, in my presentation, essentially introduce my science. And um, I'm chemist uh, by training, but uh, most of my life I worked in the field of uh, drug delivery and the field which is now called nanomedicine. Um, and um, used chemical and physical chemical principles to biological and medical problems. And um, I thought that perhaps uh, given the pandemics, I could probably just use an example of COVID-19 um, as, uh, as a way to introduce the needs of the science and power and promise of what uh, nanomedicine uh, and drug delivery and pharmaceutics in a more broader sense can do for uh, antiviral therapeutics and behind. So here is uh, the small presentation from uh, University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, uh, um, uh, where I currently uh, located. And uh, yes, I do have two affiliations, one is in UNC and another in Moscow State University. Uh, this work was done during the pandemics or these considerations came during the pandemics and uh, also some of the things I will be talking about were done in collaboration with scientists located in the Research Triangle Institute here in uh, North uh, Carolina. I want to also emphasize my conflict of interest. I've studied several companies Mm, uh, which mostly focus on drug delivery products. And one of them here in red uh, may have a direct interest in some of the things I will be talking about. Now, if we, uh, by now, we actually had a crash course in what COVID-19 is. And right now we understand that uh, uh, many uh, infected um, individuals uh, in the countries across the world, uh, I'm sorry, um, they, um, they have the um, symptomless uh, ex exhibition of, of the disease. Uh, some of them uh, become uh, symptomatic and, uh, and, and for those, uh, the disease can become uh, um, progressively, progressively more severe resulting in um, quite substantial uh, problems with the uh, lungs and uh, the um, uh, going towards the lung injury. And um, that could result in hospitalization and in the worst case scenario um, could result in the, in the death. So um, the, uh, the, the treatment of uh, uh, COVID-19 include both the attempts to overcome the, uh, the side or accompanying effects. Let me get some more um, of, the, uh, of the infection um, and um, as well as the treatment of the, uh, of the virus itself. And I want to show you um, how different it is depending on uh, the stage of the disease and depending on the strategy you choose. But I just want to tell you uh, that uh, during uh, the pandemics, we uh, try, we meaning the community tried to, uh, to address the therapeutic um, uh, scene here and substantial uh, success was achieved with the use of uh, anticoagulation therapy at the later stages of the disease, uh, which has decreased uh, the mortality considerably. One of the uh, later stage manifestation of the disease involves um, so-called cytokine storm. That's uh, essentially um, uh, the uncontrollable uh, burst release of cytokines, which lead by itself to um, adverse reaction of immune system instead of the positive reaction of the immune system. And in the, um, the cytokine storms, some critical cytokines play um, 
substantial role. So the attempts to neutralize such cytokines are like interleukin-6 uh, uh, in the cascade of the cytokines or to block uh, the consequences of the cytokine storms uh, in some other ways have been done. And from the clinical uh, results uh, thus far, at least, we haven't been uh, very successful in uh, using various antibodies against, for example, interleukin-6 receptor or interleukin-6. As far as I know, at least there is no clear cut evidence that these approaches have been successful, but there is a mounting evidence that the use of corticosteroids like dexamethasone might be um, useful in decreasing the severity of the cytokine storms and uh, possibly improving the uh, progression of the disease, although more evidence is needed here. So this is treating the consequences of the viral infection. What about the viral infection itself? Now, uh, if we look at the uh, cycle of the virus, the virus essentially uh, comes from, it comes from outside, it's airborne, and uh, it, uh, it, um, it binds with angiotensin uh, 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 converting uh, uh, receptor uh, here, AC2, and, um, and, uh, and, and then it enters the cells and then the, you have a regular uh, a reproduction cycle for the virus where the contents of the virus are mul multiplied. And so uh, then the virus is reassembled in the cell and then it's released from the cell. And this is the, uh, the cycle of virus repl replication um, in, in the lung and the nasal uh, and other cells in, in the body. So um, uh, the uh, attempts to develop antivirals have focused on the use of already approved drugs. It, that's because we don't have that much time uh, to move things to the market. So people started using variety of agents which could affect the virus reproduction using some back knowledge about similar virus, about uh, SARS-1 or MERS infected um, patients and, um, and some others. And so here, several groups of antiviral compounds have come up and uh, some of them are inhibitors of the transmembrane protease serine, serine 2. And uh, this enzyme is necessary for the entry of the virus into the cell. So some of the existing drugs that could in inhibit the protease have been considered here. Now, viral reproduction is uh, conducted by RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, and these would be typical antiviral compounds, which, um, which would be used in some other cases, such as, for example, influenza. So not surprisingly, repurposing of the Ebola virus drugs or inf influenza virus drugs or some drugs in the development have been uh, done um, in this case. So there was information re that remdesivir in particular uh, as an inhibitor um, could be used for, uh, for coronavirus infections. And um, that in part, uh, the remdesivir was developed by Gilead, but in part, these studies were carried out here at UNC by Ralph Barrick uh, in the past. So, um, so, uh, so generally, um, remdesivir and some other drugs shown here have been used uh, for uh, treatment uh, of, of the virus. Here is, for example, Avigan, the, the drug which is now manufactured in Russia and sold. Um, it's much less uh, effective, uh, as you can see from effective constants or IC50s here um, than remdesivir, um, and, uh, but still it's a, an antiviral drug. Then uh, most recently, the um, Pfizer started clinical trials of another protease inhibitor. This is three CL protease, which is important for the virus, uh, virus uh, budding or self-assembly and, uh, and, and, and budding um, in general. So, so now you have various stages of virus reproduction. And then in addition to that, um, people started 
do, doing high throughput screens with dozens of uh, thousands of agents. And out of those screens, uh, suddenly, some FDA or other regulatory agencies approved uh, agents started coming up, which have antiviral activity of unknown uh, mechanism. So now you have a lot of molecules which could potentially be useful. And uh, clearly you want to try to combine those molecules together as is shown here. So you can block various stages of the reproduction uh, of the virus to make the treatments more efficient. Um, and um, that, uh, that, that, that is a clear strategy, but what is not clear is what, uh, how to combine drugs with each other. For example, it's maybe more or less, yeah, let's try uh, to block the entry. Let's try to block the reproduction. Let's try to block the budding that, that will affect the virus from different standpoint. But there are many other molecules with the mechanisms we don't understand that well. And then it's not clear really if we combine two chemicals, whether this will result in a synergistic reaction or it will result in adverse reaction. There's enormous amount of literature and data on that, um, on, on, on that front, but rationally to mine this data with your simple mind is quite difficult. That's why uh, you know, people who work in the uh, use of knowledge mining tools uh, uh, have come into play and uh, work in particular was done not but uh, by uh, scientists here at UNC Chapel Hill Ashland School of Pharmacy, actually headed by the graduate of uh, chemistry department of Moscow State University, Alex Tropsha, uh, who is a, comp uh, who is a um, chemoinformatics uh, guru. And so essentially these uh, by medical knowledge mining tools combine a lot of data to figure out which uh, on the synergistic pathway of production and also analyzing a lot of other factors just the fact we were uh, uh, for the negative interactions and uh, they thought that there will be synergy or there will be um, some antagonism. So here the synergy is shown in red and you can see that certain combinations are predicted to be synergistic. So they went into depth uh, and they did the cellular screen for the virus reproduction. In cell screen, they demonstrate that indeed certain drugs are synergistic. So that's the result of uh, their studies. So uh, nitazaxanid, which, um, uh, which is an approved anti-parasitic drug uh, agents. And one of them is already the remdesivir, which I mentioned. Uh, another is um, modequin, which is, um, which is actually a uh, anti-malarial drug. And uh, another is uh, 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 umifenavir, which uh, is known to Russian colleagues as, um, uh, uh, as arbidol. Uh, actually, so so these drugs are uh, are synergistic. Now, if we look at these molecules, actually, each of this drug is very poorly soluble, and um, and 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 there is an unmet meat here. How can we create those drug combinations which we can co co-administer together? Here comes the problem of the solubility of the agents. Um, and uh, here is remdesivir. Remdesivir, that's the only drug in the United States which was um, emergency approved for the use uh, in the COVID patients and which has shown uh, detected uh, uh, extension um, of uh, shortening of the disease and, and the benefit in, in more or less advanced patients. So it is administered intravenously at this point and remdesivir is a poorly soluble molecule. It's administered about 200 milligrams day one, followed by 100 milligrams for either 
four subsequent days in the five-day course or for um, nine days in the 10-day course. So uh, uh, as I mentioned, remdesivir is very poorly soluble molecule. So how does industry usually go about solubility? They currently uh, use often cyclodextrins and in particular, this is an example of uh, sulfabutyl ether cyclodextrin um, uh, known as captizol. It has a hydrophobic pocket, so the drug can be entrapped into this hydrophobic pocket and the whole complex is soluble. Now, in order to solubilize remdesivir in particular and obtain an injectable um, uh, solution, uh, one needs to have 30 times more by weight of cyclic dextrin versus drug. That means with the five-day course, the patient is getting eight grams of cyclodextrin with a 10-day course, 33 grams of cyclodextrin. And even though uh, there are several dozens of drugs which uh, use cyclodextrin intravenously injected, even at much higher uh, amounts, especially in severe cancer cases, this is a lot of unnecessary excipient, which is uh, removed by uh, renal fight filtration. And even though it's effectively eliminated in healthy people, it is a challenge of its elimination in people with compromised kidney system and, um, and uh, renal failure uh, is often seen in COVID poor patients. So there is a goal for, uh, for chemists and formulation scientists to decrease uh, amount of excipient by increasing the drug load. Now, this is the problems which nanomedicine solves. Essentially, uh, we know that many small molecules have um, issues uh, and uh, suffer in particular from poor solubility. So we create uh, the nanocarriers uh, and the ideal delivery system, it has to be quite versatile. So we can inject it intravenously, administer orally or topically. It should have high drug content and just little, uh, little excipient or little carrier and a lot of drug has to have high drug concentration. The particles should be small. So um, if you need to enter the cells, uh, then you can enter the cells through endocytosis and the particle size better be less than 50 nanometers, at least less than 100 nanometers. Should be easy to redisperse and it could deliver multiple agents in one. Remember the combinations which we need to, 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 to deliver to the same cells. Easy to manufacture and have uh, um, essentially possibility for high throughput formulation. So uh, that we can combine those many combinations which come from the predictions or the um, drug repositioning, uh, high throughput screening. Uh, when um, COVID started, we, um, we could only work on COVID for some time. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and, and my students focused on remdesivir and we started using some of, uh, of our delivery system and without, uh, within probably a few days, we developed the ultra high loaded remdesivir nanoparticle formulation um, that happened in March. And, um, and, and, and the, the features of this formulation has small particle size uh, from 20 to 70 nanometers, depending on loading, very narrow polydispersity. It contains uh, eight milligram per milliliter in solution of remdesivir and only a 10 milligram per milliliter of excipient. So the drug loading capacity here is 44% and it uses 26 times less excipient than current Gilead's uh, formulation. It has extremely high solution stability. Uh, we know from anti-cancer drugs we developed that it, the delivery system is, is quite safe. And you see you, you use very small amount of excipient. And so that could be a better remdesivir. Now, if we think about uh, the virus of the entry point of the virus, the virus comes uh, to us from, uh, from airways and essentially it affects the nasal, uh, nasal uh, cells first. In fact, the, in the normal uh, human, um, healthy human, the level of expression of AC, 
uh, two receptors in the nasal cells is much higher than in lungs. People with inflammation have high level of receptor in the lungs. And essentially, that's the work from Ralph Barrick's lab. Essentially, what was shown that it is easier to infect uh, nasal cells than to infect lung cells. And in the individuals with the diabetes or other inflammatory diseases, the level of receptor in the lungs is higher. So the virus is more likely to affect the lungs. But in any case, if you think about this route of entry of the virus, uh, then uh, you would think that at early stages of the diseases, when the patients are um, showing some uh, disease, uh, but the disease is in the upper and the lower airways. So if we think about remdesivir, which is administered intravenously, that's not the best way to deliver it to the lungs if it still sits uh, um, and, and especially if the, disease, if the virus still is in the upper airways, you would probably need to deliver these uh, remdesivir or other drug through the, uh, through the airways. And so the direct respiratory administration uh, would be the right way of administering this, um, this at the early stage of the disease. When the disease is more advanced and becomes more systemic, reaches the lungs and probably goes beyond then there is a point of treating the patients with injectable um, remdesivir. And um, so uh, in uh, understanding of that, we and others as well understood that there is an unmet need for uh, inhalation delivery of antivirals to upper and lower respiratory tract. So again, in our work, we use some of the nanocrystal technology and we created the nanocrystals, uh, which we could administer uh, through the airway. And here comes the issue. You can create nanoparticles and solubilize them with, or stabilize that with the surfactant. But you need to have very small amounts of surfactant in your formulation to, to go to the lungs. In fact, we put it at 5% of the drug. So it's much more stringent, no way um, uh, fifty percent or whatever uh, Gilead originally had. So you need to have that small amount of surfactant, and even at these small amounts of the surfactants, you have a lot of foaming, and foaming is uh, affecting the particle supply through the nub nebulizer, the device which creates the aerosol. So you have the change or instability in the drug concentration over the work of this delivery system. And uh, we wanted to get rid of foaming. And while I cannot tell how we did it, but we came up with a technology which allows us to dramatically decrease the foaming and at the same time have uh, stabilized uh, nanocrystals of remdesivir, which um, have been aerosolized and administered in this way. When we did that, in um, we did that actually in April, but in June, Gilead developed their own aerosolized formulation and they moved to the clinical trials, which Sorry, allows, allows yeah, I'm finishing, which allows um, Gilead to, and hopefully uh, to treat, uh, to treat uh, patients earlier. So if we think of this uh, case, the unmet drug delivery needs and therapy of COVID, and in particular with antiviral drugs, is to develop novel high capacity forms of therapeutic agents for COVID-19 uh, to decrease uh, the amount of excipient, to develop combination therapies which could allow us to deliver insoluble drugs to the same cells together to affect multiple targets. Uh, obviously, we need to think of the stages of the disease here and develop aerosols and other inhalable uh, systems. And at that point, I hope um, um, I, I, I hope I didn't use too much of your time, but I would like to thank uh, you for attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was an excellent presentation. So I propose if we can have some discussion maybe after the talks, because because uh, we probably can run a little bit out of time, but I have one small question, but very general one. So today I, I, I learned that uh, Johnson & Johnson, I think uh, the company that stopped its developing of its vaccine. So how in general you can estimate the, uh, the attempts, uh, international and national attempts in different countries to develop COVID vaccine and are we close to successful end of the story? 
well, uh, I'll give you a shortest answer possible. Normally, development of vaccine takes years um, uh, because after uh, the phase three trials, you also look at the use of the vaccine and you look at the adverse effect in the long trials. Right now, the phase three trials are conducted in the shortest possible um, possible ways. We are in the middle of pandemics. Uh, there are several mechanisms for, um, uh, of action of vaccines. Um, people look at adverse effects and stopping the phase three trial um, as a result of adver adverse effect is not unusual. Um, it, there is a reassessment of the risks and the trial could be con uh, continued. Um, we don't know, uh, I don't think we will have the vaccine this year um, fully uh, um, uh, finished. Well, the, fin the clinical trial may be ending uh, for some of the US vaccine with a normal uh, number of patients, but um, it will take some time for reassessment. So it's extremely, extremely fast. Um, I think uh, vaccines will be successful uh, many of them will work, uh, but uh, in the longer run, we don't yet know whether they will have adverse effects of the sort of enhancing disease in some of the patients. So for that, uh, risks are still out there, but I think we will have to start using those vaccines and see what happens. I injected myself with the experimental vaccine, as you know, this is the Pfizer nanotechnology-based vaccine. And yeah, just, but I know where the risks are. Thank you very much. So we, we, we will continue the discussion after all the talks and I would like to give the floor to Lars Anderson, who is, according to my knowledge, collaborating with Anastasia. So please, Lars, the floor is yours. Let's see if I can get my screen up and going. Okay, uh, can you hear me and, and can you see my first slide? Don't your slides. Yeah. No, okay. not yet. Not yet. Uh, hang on. Uh, the green button? No, it's the blue one this time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to this uh, roundtable discussion. Uh, at, uh, we are moving at a couple of hours uh, east of Moscow now to Denmark, and uh, here's a uh, what you see is, uh, is a, a, a photograph of the campus in Aarhus and Aarhus city. And uh, I am, let me just see if I can make it move. Yeah, this is me and I'm sitting in the physics uh, building that you have right here. Uh, and this is the campus. I'm a physicist uh, by training, uh, I've moved from antiprotons, electrons, atoms, and uh, now into molecules and, and even uh, a little bit of uh, biomolecules. So um, I think this is a picture which is actually made by Anastasia Pochenkova uh, illustrates the focus, my interest. So I'm interested in, in uh, small organic molecules uh, which are light absorbing and uh, the absorption of a photon brings it from the ground uh, state to an, some electronic excited state and there uh, all the fun starts, uh, the, the system uh, moves and, and reacts to the uh, to the energy that it gained by the photon absorption. And, and the molecules, they, uh, the inspiration is actually molecules which, uh, have, uh, which are found in proteins and in nature, in green leaves and DNA and so on. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, interesting questions to answer there. So uh, we're talking about, we call those light absorbing molecules for biochromophores. Um, they are light sensors. You use them uh, in your vision, in your eye. Uh, they are used as photo switches, uh, molecular machines, and for light harvesting in green plants and for fluorescent purposes. And of, of, it's also important in UV protection of DNA and, and sunscreens. So uh, biochromophores, they connect to chemistry because we use chemistry, not in my lab, but in good friends, uh, colleagues uh, labs uh, to synthesize uh, these uh, chromophores. Uh, we heavily rely on quantum theory, uh, also normally in the chemistry departments. And I'll give you, this is the focus of the theme here, right? I mean, theory meets uh, experiments. So uh, here in, in the physics department where I 
belong. We do atomic molecular and optical physics. That is, we apply lasers and atomic techniques uh, on biochromophores. And we touch up towards proteins and biotechnology, not in the sense that uh, of, of uh, the first talk here where we uh, with drug delivery and, and so on, but uh, to, a, to a smaller scale, uh, perhaps. And uh, is it uh, worthy? Is it worth uh, anything for society? Well, we hope to get a better understanding on how these molecules, they work uh, it, as in individual entities and, and uh, thereby also give some basis uh, for other applications. So we have uh, a pretty reductionist uh, approach uh, to our research, meaning that, that we work with biochromophores in vacuum. That is, we take out the, the, uh, the photoactive part of, of, of the biological system, in this case, a protein. We take out that biochromophore and we study that as an isolated uh, molecule uh, without uh, perturbation. So it's in vacuum. There are no water molecules. Uh, uh, surrounding or anything else. And then we can add one by one, we add perturbations uh, to see what effect they have uh, on, on the behavior of the, of the chromophore. And then uh, at the end, we end up with, with the whole protein uh, system and try to understand that. So, and what, what kind of interactions uh, do we talk about? Well, we have, uh, we have counter ions, that is ions uh, of a different charge than than the charts that may be present on the chromophore. We have hydrogen bonding, we have electric field and steric effects and so on. And we use light as a tool. Uh, lasers, uh, they work nice because you can change the, the wavelengths very easily and you can do the spectroscopy you want. You can address specific states. You can, uh, you, you, you know exactly how much energy you, you deposit in the molecule. That's just the photon energy. Uh, by using pulse lasers, you can uh, initiate your, uh, the photochemistry or photophysics uh, at a given time when you fire the laser. And then at a later time, you can, you can probe the status of, of the photoexcited state by a second laser pulse. So this is known as uh, pump probe uh, techniques. So theory meets experiment. And uh, you can also say experiment meets theory. So it's a sort of a circular uh, argument here uh, where theory make predictions and uh, they can be tested out in experiments. Uh, so you design an experiment, do observations and so on. Uh, I, I just like to point out here that, uh, you know, as you go up in the size of your mo molecule, and this is even a small molecule compared to what you saw before with about uh, less than uh, 50 atoms or so. The, I mean, the calculational effort, the uh, grows uh, really uh, with the with number of atoms. So, uh, and we are, I think we are right at the border with 50 to 100 atoms where you can really do the, the very best uh, calculations uh, possible. So we are, we are sort of pushing the limit here. Uh, Anastasia can comment on that later, but uh, I, I definitely it's difficult to do a very high up initial uh, uh, calculation with more than 100 atoms, I think. So we are at the limit. Uh, which is nice uh, um, uh, for a lot of reasons. So we can either uh, start with the experiment and do observations. That, that would be uh, sort of my obvious starting point, being an experimentalist. Of course, you could also, if you're brave, uh, do your calculation and make predictions, uh, which you can then uh, compare to experiments. I added this slide here because I think it's important to also notice that, you, I mean, our perception of nature, you know, and our intuition, uh, to some extent, is based on math. That's that's our language, and at the same time, uh, we also have sort of a, a visual understanding of how how the world is, and and so it's we are working with an interplay of of using the language of mathematics and and still get a an intuitive feeling of what's going on. I would like to quote here. Uh, George uh, Walt, uh, who is a Nobel Prize winner for, for his work on, on, on vision. And he, he said he had cause uh, to believe or feel that his hands were more clever than his, uh, his head, um, meaning that that's a, another way of phrasing or, or emphasizing the importance of, of experiments. And, and uh, he also said that uh, an experiment is a device to make nature speak uh, and, and make it understandable. Uh, 
And then after you have devised your experiment, uh, you only have to listen. That's very nice. <laughs> Sounds very nice and easy. Um, the experiments that we do here, if you look at the top part, we do uh, absorption spectroscopy of these uh, chromophores. That is, we see at what wavelengths they uh, absorb photons. Uh, the top one here is uh, chlorophyll. You notice there's a gap here at around 500 nanometers. 500 nanometers is a green light, so that's why your leaves are green. Uh, we can also detect the fluorescence if the state up here lives long enough. It will emit a photon and we can detect the spectrum of that. And finally, we have another setup where uh, we can first excite the molecule to some excited state and then we can follow the wave packet which is launched up here and, and see how, how it, uh, it moves in time. So that's the pump probe technique I spoke about before. So. Um, so uh, let's just go back to that vacuum thing because uh, many, uh, even I mean, chemists and biologists, they, you know, why vacuum and what is a vacuum? Well, a vacuum is uh, is uh, just uh, empty space, you can say, and that's where you have the isolated uh, the chromophore, the isolated molecule. So it's the simplest case. You can we, you can select the mass and charge, and then you can build the complexes where you have specific interactions. That is, you can avoid uh, solution phase interaction, and you can provide benchmark data for theory. And speaking about benchmark data uh, for, for quantum theory, when you have that, you can improve your quantum uh, uh, techniques, the computational techniques, and you can make reliable predictions, which I think is very important. Because with uh, your, your, your theory and your, your, your calculations, you can now uh, you can now simulate conditions which are hard to make in the lab, could be in, in biology, astrophysics, and plasmas, and so on. Uh, and you also have access to, to, to play around with parameters that you cannot do in an experiment. You can turn on and off certain interactions which are very hard to do in the lab. And of course, you can uh, suggest new measurements, tests, and, and applications uh, even. So uh, just to say, here it is, just to say that uh, it is important to have theory uh, working uh, and being calibrated. Here's one example. Uh, a it's a calculation of Anastasia. It's the absorption profile of this uh, retinal chromophore. Here it's in the all transform. Um, so, but it's, it's very similar to what you have in your eye to, to absorb uh, visible photons. And this is, uh, this is the, uh, the blue curve here is what we measure. And the, and the red one is, is a calculated one, I think at 500 Kelvin. But you can see here in the simulation, in the calculator, not a simulation, it's, it's a real calculation, I've initial calculation, that if you cool down uh, the, the, the chromophore, the sample, you, you, you really see a, a huge spectral change, which, uh, which is related to the less population of, of uh, vibrational states in the chromophore. So that's a prediction. And it's, uh, at the moment, we are building a, a helium, liquid helium cool trap to uh, where we would like to test if this uh, prediction holds uh, water. So that, that's a critical test, I would say, of the theory. Another experiment where we have joined uh, the collaborative effort is, is we looked at the lifetime of the green fluorescent protein. And here's a picture of, uh, of the lab laboratory where we have two laser pulses here, a green and an orange one that we can, we can first pump the system into an excited state and by the other color, we can, we can probe it. You see it here in, in the green fluorescent protein chromophore, it looks like that. We excite by 480 nanometers and then we probe by a, an infrared photon 800 nanometers and make and knock off an electron. So that's, uh, that's our signal that we create a neutral fragment. Alternatively, as shown below here, we can wait until the system has returned to the ground state and then we can use another photon of the same uh, color to re-excite the molecule and, and, and have, a, have a two photon signal in that way. And here's the result. We see the excited state decays. That's, that's a, this curve here. And at the same time, you, your population in the ground state, it grows and it has exactly the same time. So it takes the same time to leave the excited state as it gets to reach the ground state as, as you would, might expect. Now, the point is that we have two lifetimes, a, a long one uh, of 11 picoseconds and a shorter one of 1.3 picoseconds. You can now change the temperature and you see those, those lifetimes, here's the short and here's the long one, they change dramatically with temp temperature. And um, 
it's not until you, uh, you you do a full calculation of the potential energy curve for, for the excited state that you see you actually have barriers up here. In other words, if you pump up, you excite the system up here, it matters a lot if you have a hot or, hot or cold molecule. As when they get cold, they start to get more and more tra uh, trapped for longer and longer time up here. And eventually they start to fluoresce. And we expect to see that also in the gas phase. And the role of the protein here is actually that it, it helps the molecule to stay up here and, and these, uh, the, uh, the coordinates here, the twisting angles of, of the two rings in the chromophore. So that's one case where the theory really says, well, uh, it makes sense that it lives longer when you cool it because you have to cross these barriers. Here. So that's a theory from Moscow State University. And the, the last exam, example here is the, is the retinal chromophore, the, which can be all trans as up here or 11 Cs. And this is the excited state lifetimes that we, that we measure. And both in the case where we start out with this chromophore and with that chromophore, we get this, the very same two lifetimes. One is short, 400 femtoseconds, that's the red curve here, and then a long one. But the ratio of those two are not the same. Uh, so, uh, so that that you know, that's just a, what what the experiment says. So, what what's going on? And then again, you you look to theory, and and you you start calculating the potential energy surfaces. Uh, and and here's the uh, the eleven uh, cis configuration here, or isomer, which corresponds to that one. And what you see is that the there is really no barrier for the uh, for the excited state here. So so that would then correspond to a very short lifetime here. We also have a short lifetime here, but, but less molecules. And that's because this is not, when you do the experiment, it's very hard to, to have isolated this uh, isomer relative to that one. So we always in the experiment have, have, a, have a mixture of it. On the other hand, if you look at that chroma, that's all trans, you know, the, if you look at the excited state bar uh, uh, oops, sorry, at the excited state, you have significant barriers and that, that is what is called is causing the long lifetime. So again, here theory is actually able to pretty nicely uh, explain what's going on in the experiment. So again, if you here's this is the cis version of the chromophore. Here's the trans version of the chromophore. So if you excite in the cis form very rapidly, you move over here. Whereas if you excite the trans, all trans, you have an, a significant barrier which makes the lifetime longer. Okay, uh, so I think this was more or less my 10 minutes. Uh, so I would uh, like to thank my own collaborators here at Aarhus University, uh, mostly postdocs list, uh, men mentioned here, and then also uh, Professor Steen Bronsten Nielsen and Henrik uh, uh, Peterson. And uh, as it was said in the introduction, I've had a many years of uh, collaboration with Anastasia at Moscow State University. It's been a real pleasure and it's very important to us. I also would like to acknowledge people who have made the chromophores, uh, and in particular Moody Chavez uh, in, in Israel, and then, uh, of course, some support from, from funding and so on. And with that, oops, that was something I was not going to show you. If you ask questions, you can. Uh, <laughs> that was a lifetime of the chromophore, uh, not published yet. Okay, thank you for listening uh, uh, here from, uh, from August. Thank you very much. Anastasia, maybe you can um, add some few comments to the to the excellent talk. Um, well, I just want to say that, um, well, I'm really happy to collaborate with so many experimental guys. And what I think, uh, I won't give uh, any details about the theory, because I think it's uh, a little bit too difficult for such a presentation. But at the same time, I'm happy because, you know, just uh, from a theoretical perspective, when you are a theoretician uh, and when you have some friends who always um, ask questions, you know, why is that? Why is uh, this going? And so on. And then sometimes these questions, they uh, sometimes they even um, seem to be very simple. But then you start to think and they are not so simple after all. And then you have, you know, to advance the theory to be able to answer the question. So I think that it's really important to have a collaboration like this. And I'm really happy to have this. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I believe we can have all the questions up to the end of the, all the talks. And I would like uh, to give the floor to Helen Fielding. 
Department of Chemistry, University of College London, UK. Helen, please. Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. So, oops. in some ways, my uh, my talk follows on quite nicely from uh, from Lars. Um, so, we're also interested in looking at the photochemistry of uh, the building blocks of complex systems. Um, and the motivation for this is really uh, if we can learn from how nature has such, say, such an efficient photosynthetic uh, mechanism, then that mm. will ultimately allow us to design uh, more, in, uh, more efficient solar cells, perhaps, and learning how the firefly produces its bioluminescence that can perhaps lead us to develop new um, um, sense um, molecules and systems for biomolecular imaging and advanced imaging, so deep tissue imaging in the infrared. Mm -hmm. Oops. Um, so at the heart of all these systems, as Lars has just said, is a small molecular chromophore that absorbs the visible or ultraviolet light. And uh, that chromophore is responsible for its color. Um, and so an example, as we have just seen, is uh, rat retinal. So this is an image from um, this paper. It's not our work of um, uh, uh, the inside of a, of a retina. And uh, so th this is responsible for vision. And the receptor protein is a complicated thing like this um, that's found in the rods in our retina. But it's actually this small molecule in the middle, this chromophore, that does the uh, absorbing of the light. And when it absorbs a, a light, the light, it undergoes a small molecular change, confirmation at the end. So over the years, over the decades, there's been a huge amount of work looking at these isolated chromophores and trying to understand them better because they are the thing that absorbs the light. And there is absolutely no doubt that if we can do gas phase spectroscopy on these, we will get the most information. And it's much easier to compare gas phase experiments with gas phase theory, which is crucial to understanding these processes and understanding the things that we're observing in spectroscopy. But it's also true that real chemistry and real biology don't actually happen in the gas phase. And so the environment of that protein, or often in chemistry, water or some other solvent around these small uh, molecular chromophores is very important and plays a role in changing the photochemistry. And so it's really nice if we can try and understand what happens to the isolated chromophore and the chromophore in its complex environment. So in our group, we're using a, a spectroscopic tool that can allow us to do exactly that, that can allow us to um, look at the spectroscopy or the energy levels of these um, systems that are important in photochemistry, both in the gas phase and in complex environments, and then comparing um, an analogous measurement in the two different cases. So uh, the tool that we use is photoelectron spectroscopy. And the way this works is we basically put in a photon that um, takes out an electron. And by conserving energy, we can, if we know the photon energy that went in and we can measure the electron energy that comes out, we can tell the binding energy of the um, orbital um, from which the electron is ejected. So it gives us the um, energy, the electronic energy levels that are important in photochemistry. Um, so we can do this in a multi-photon way. We can put one photon in to excite the molecule and then it will do its molecular changes and so forth that are important in photochemistry. And then we can put a, a second photon in to remove the um, electron, measure the kinetic energy, and it tells us the excited state that's involved in the photochemistry. And we can also do this in a time resolved way um, by delaying this uh, first photon from the second photon, and it tells us what's going on on the excited state. And I wanted to put this picture up because um, this is our new lab at UCL. Um, so 
we started the year full of high hopes that we would have moved this nice new basement lab in March. But of course we were disturbed by the pandemic. <laughs> so we, we shut down our lab upstairs um, in March uh, and then returned for two weeks of science, three weeks of science before we had to begin the torturous process of moving it down with uh, reduced numbers of people in the lab <laughs> during the pandemic, but we're there. Um, so we have three laser tables going backwards. We have nanosecond lasers and femtosecond lasers and some new femtosecond lasers coming, which is very exciting. Um, and we have a couple of gas phase experiments. We have um, one over here, which is our electrospray experiment that allows us to put some um, anions in the gas phase, a molecular beam, which allows us to put neutral species in the gas phase, a liquid jet, photoelectron spectrometer, which allows us to put these um, chromophores in liquids in the gas phase, um, and uh, a, a surface science instrument that allows us to look at species on surfaces. And these two are now just about to go again. And um, these two have had some small technical problems in the move. Um, so I too am going to tell you a little bit about GFP and do some comparisons between the gas phase and solution phase. So this green fluorescent protein is found in this jellyfish and it's responsible um, for the jellyfish generating, um, converting blue light into green light. It's won some Nobel prizes for its discovery and showing how it can be widely used in um, imaging in the life sciences. And, um, and it's been exploited for uh, the beginnings of super resolution imaging that allow you to see even more detail inside living cells. But I think understanding the processes is um, crucially important if we want to design new tools for imaging, say more in the infrared or things that can be multicolor um, imaging tools. So we use um, electrospray ionization to put this chromophore that you'll recognize from Lars's um, presentation into the gas phase. And um, we use photoelectron spectroscopy, which means we take this anion, we fire it in to some um, our, um, velocity map imaging spectrometer, um, we put a photon in to uh, detach an electron from this chromophore, and then we image the electrons on this detector at the end. And um, this, this particular gas phase spectrum, although it's not perfectly vibrationally resolved, you can see that we can see um, some sort of vibrational structure. We can resolve things because in the gas phase, this molecule is on its own. Largely, most of them are in more or less one confirmation. And some of our work in this area has um, benefited hugely from a collaboration with Anastasia, um, where she was able to calculate the uh, excited states of the um, uh, protein chromophore in the gas phase. And we compared um, the energy levels of these with those that calculated for the um, protein chromophore in the protein itself. And what was particularly significant for our later work was um, this particular high-lying uh, electronically excited state, which was proposed to be uh, responsible in the protein for um, the generation of solvated electrons. Then most recently, we've carried out um, a study of uh, uh, this protein chromophore in the solution. So in this experiment, we have a, a, a very thin um, jet, 10 micron jet of liquid with our chromophore in it. Um, we catch it and recirculate it because it's expensive because our colleagues have made it for us. We put our photons in and then we collect electrons in a time of flight. Um, in our time of flight spectrometer. And you can see immediately that in a liquid, oops, in a liquid, the spectra are not any ever going to be vibrationally resolved. And um, calculations in a liquid are really in incredibly complicated. Not only was this experiment recorded in water, and water is a polar solvent and it's very hard to do calculations in water, but um, because everything is very fluid and the um, water molecules can arrange themselves very differently around 
uh, many different chromophores, you actually have to do a lot of calculations of chrom chromophores with all different amounts, different orientations of water around them. But um, thanks to Anastasia doing such very complex calculations on systems that are many, many, many more than hundreds of atoms, Lars, actually, because you've got all these waters as well. Um, we actually have the most amazing agreement between experiment and theory, which uh, is, is, is absolutely incredible, I think. So this is the picture of the energy levels in the gas phase. So this is the amount of energy required to detect the electron. This is the picture in the protein that I showed you from the previous slide. And this is the picture in water. And what's really remarkable is this, this um, state that's been proposed to be responsible for donating electrons into the continuum in the um, protein looks like it's very similar in, um, in bulk water. And although the absorption spectrum of the um, molecule in the gas phase is very similar to the absorption spectrum of the uh, chromophore in its protein, the higher lying energy level structure and the detachment energy um, of water is very similar to the protein, suggesting that water is also a good molecule, uh, a model for the environment in the protein. And this work's um, been submitted for publication. Now, something else that we've been looking at is um, bioluminescence. That's this uh, chemical process that's responsible for um, the beautiful emission that you get from fireflies. Um, and so in, in a, an enzyme, this uh, um, uh, luciferin undergoes a, a, a chemical reaction and generates this oxyluciferin in its deprotonated anionic form in the excited state, which I think I showed too quickly. And then this um, pops down to the ground state and emits a photon. So we've also carried out some um, uh, gas phase uh, measurements of both the uh, luciferin and the oxyluciferin. And uh, we're just about to embark on a series of experiments to look at this in the solution phase and also hopefully in the enzyme in our liquid jet. So in our group, I hope I've kind of um, given you the, uh, some of my enthusiasm for using this single uh, spectroscopic technique, photoelectron spectroscopy, and being able to compare uh, analogous measurements in the gas and the condensed phases and hopefully um, you can uh, uh, agree with me that this combination of these two sorts of measurements, crucially, together with high level computational chemistry calculations, really shows great promise as a means to improving our understanding of uh, photochemistry in complex systems. And I'll end with my acknowledgement slides. And it's very sad because we normally always have pictures of our group in real life where we're standing next to each other, but this is not possible anymore. Here we were celebrating, um, so, well, not celebrating, we were having a farewell drink for one of my um, group leaving. But um, these are the people that contributed to some of the work from um, UCL that I've discussed. I very much like to thank Anastasia for um, past collaborations and hopefully many more fruitful future collaborations. Um, also my colleague Graham Worth um, and his postdoc Mariana, uh, who've also done some theory. We don't make any molecules in our lab either. I wouldn't have a clue how to do it. So I'd like to thank these colleagues for, for making these nice molecules, these people for their funding. And I'd like to thank you also for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So as far as I understand, uh, Anastasia is making uh, the calculations for, for this type of research. Is, 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 is it correct? Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. this is correct. Great. Do you have something to add, Anastasia? Um, I can just add that um, we really want to develop the methods that can treat gas phase molecules, liquid phase molecules, and also even the proteins uh, at the same high level of theory. And it's tremendously difficult, I would say, because uh, if you don't know how it works in the gas phase and whether you are really can uh, predict the properties of the gas phase molecules, then probably you shouldn't do the liquid phase and protein calculations. But once you know, then you know the difficulty of really uh, getting the right answer uh, because you are using the right methods, I would say. And we are heavily using the Lomonosov Supercomputing Center here at Moscow State University. And we are also very grateful to have this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
So we move forward, and it's my pleasure to give the floor to Jan Verlet, Department of Chemistry, Durham University, UK. Hello, everyone. I'm going to start sharing my screen, so yep. hopefully this works. Does that work? Yeah. Okay. So th thank you very much for having me. And um, what I'd like to do is um, our research group in Durham, which is, which is not too far from where Helen Fielding is, but just a little further north. It's already getting dark here. What we'd like to, we, we, we do experiments on, on similar things to what Helen and Lars do. But what, what I thought I'd do today is, is really try and, and um, talk a little bit about science and how science tries to sometimes solve simple problems. Um, but you'd be surprised, I think, that some simple problems we don't have answers to. And so what I will do is I'll just talk about a case study of a simple question that I hope I will try and convince you is not actually that simple, but we can still try and, and learn things about it. And so the, the question I'd like to ask is, how does an anion form? And most of you will sit there and think, come on, this isn't real science. This is, this is a silly question. And you, you'd say that because if I take some salt, some table salt, which is sodium chloride, and I throw it in some water, then we all know what happens. The salt disappears and it disappears because I have this crystal and it makes chloride ions and sodium cations. So I have cations and I have anions. And so you'd argue, great, I've made an anion. So problem solved. Actually, it's, it's not quite that simple. And the reason it's not quite that simple is it's actually water that's driving the formation of the chloride. It's the water that dissolves the crystal. And without the water, this wouldn't happen at all. We all know this because if we just leave salt sit on the table, it sits there forever. And so the, the question I'd like to ask is, what if there's no water present? What if I just have a, a molecule, call it X, it doesn't really matter what it is, and I want to add an electron to this to make an anion. How does this actually work? So let's think a little bit about this. If I have my molecule, which is just some red line here, and my vertical axis here is, is an indication of energy. And if I can make a stable um, anion, negatively charged molecule, then of course it should be lower in energy, so it, it would be stable. And now I'm going to throw an electron on this. And we know that electrons always have to have a positive kinetic energy. So there's no such thing as negative kinetic energy. We all know this because kinetic energy is half mv squared. Mass is a positive number, and the velocity squared must be a positive number. So the only place I can attach an electron is in this blue box here. And so I've drawn a molecule just on the right here. So if I throw an electron on this, and let's hope this works, there it goes. Along it comes, and what happens is it just bounces off. I don't make an anion. Nothing happens. The electron just pings off it. So if I now want to make an anion, what I really need is I need something to accept that electron, to hold on to it for, for, for just a little while. So imagine I have an excited state of my mole molecular anion. So here's my, my, my molecule minus. This is my anion. And there's some higher lying state, some energetic state associated with that anion. Now, if I throw in my, my, my electron, what I can have is that the electron holds on to the, well, the molecule holds on to the electron for a little while. Of course, there's a problem because the energy is still very high. And so the electron can leave whenever it wants. So if I really want to make my molecule minus in this gray area here, what I have to do is I have to lose this energy somehow. I have to somehow get from this initial state that I've attached my electron to down to my molecule minus. And then I've made an anion. So how do I do this? So imagine I, I, I come in with my electron and I've stuck on the electron right at the beginning. And I have two paths that I've drawn here. The upper path forms an anion and the lower path does not form an anion. Now, as the electron comes in, what I really need to do is I need to move my atoms around in my molecule. Moving my atoms around in my molecule allows me to exchange energy with the electron. And so in that way, I can lose some energy. So in the upper part here, what I've drawn is a molecule, just two atoms falling apart. And as it falls apart, if it can fall apart fast enough, it can potentially hold on to one of these, these charges and I've made an anion in this case. This top process is called dissociative electron attachment. 
a fancy word for just saying I've made an anion by a molecule falling apart. But really what, what, what happens more often than not is the bottom trace here. And in the bottom trace, my molecule is starting to fall apart, but at all times the electron can leave. And so as I'm going along this path, the electron leaves. And if it leaves before the electron can be, be caught, of course, I have no anions. I've just got two neutral atoms in this case. So the punchline then is to understand what, this, what is going on here, what we have to do is we have to be able to look at the motion of the atoms on the time scale that the atoms move in molecules. And of course, we've already touched upon this, but it's really quite remarkable. So, so, so I'd like to talk a little bit more about this. So how fast do atoms move in molecules? I have a picture here of, of some molecule um, and it's just showing a vibration. So this is hydrogen atoms moving in, in, in some molecules. And, and, and just as, as a general guide, a molecule will vibrate about 100,000, thousand million times per second. And this is a lot of zeros. And what, what it corresponds to, just to put this into perspective, it's comparable to the gap between, between a second and the age of the dinosaurs. So dinosaurs roamed the world 66 million years ago, something like that. If I turn that into seconds, I end up with a similar gap. So that hopefully puts some perspective into how, how, how many times a molecule vibrates in one second. It's, it's an insane amount of times. So if we now want to be able to see this motion, we have to work really hard. To see the motion, what we really want to be able to do is to, to take pictures of this motion in, on the time scale that things move. And for this, we can use light pulses. Um, both Helen Fielding and, and Lars Anderson have already touched upon this. You can make light pulses that are so short that are shorter than actually the motion of atoms in molecules. And, and a Nobel Prize was awarded for this in, in the 1980s for the, for the production of very, or the use of very short pulses to look at, at, at atoms in molecules. Actually, it turns out there was also a Nobel Prize in the 60s for George Porter, who did the first time resolved types of measurements. And there will soon, I'm sure, be a new one for for going beyond femtosecond pulses and into the next domain, which is attosecond pulses. But the way these experiments work, and, and you've already seen this, is you come in with light and you excite a molecule. And then the molecule say, in, in my picture here, I have a time axis going this way, and my molecule's just falling apart. And so what I would do experimentally is, I come in with a very short pulse that triggers the reaction, and then sometime later, I come in with a second pulse, my pro pulse, and I look at what's happened. And then I repeat that experiment by changing the delay between my initial excitation and my probe, and so on and so forth. And in that way, I can really look at the molecule falling apart. Okay, so this is great. I have a way of looking at molecules, but actually what I'm, what I'm just talking about is not solving the problem that I set out to answer. What I'm interested in is how does an anion form? So light hitting my molecule is irrelevant. What I want to do is I want to have an electron hitting my molecule, and then I look at what the electron hitting my molecule does. And so really having this light there is, is, is almost looking at the wrong problem. And it turns out that this is really a very difficult problem because it is not yet or ever, I will, I will say something about this in a second, possible to make short pulses short electron pulses. So what we'd like to be able to do is make electron pulses that are shorter than the motion of atoms in molecules. And I say yet or ever, um, in principle, you can make them, but it's at energy so high that the electrons are essentially relativistic. Um, and so that's, that's kind of useless from the, from the chemistry perspective. Um, and I, I, I say yet because it hasn't been done yet. And I also say ever because if, if we think about making very short electron pulses, that's a real problem because electrons repel each other. It's not like light. Light doesn't interact with itself, but electrons do. So they will always repel each other. And so if I try and make, try and bunch lots of electrons very close to each other, they will always try and push each other apart. And so my pulses will always end up being, being long. So this is really sad, right? All I've said so far is that it appears that my simple question of how does an anion form, we cannot probe. It's not possible to probe this simple reaction, something that we, we all think we should understand by now. And it's really sad, so I've got a sad face right here, predominantly because it's such an important reaction. 
the reaction of an electron plus a, uh, plus a molecule really underpins huge amounts of science. So I have some pictures here. So the first thing would be something like plasma science, plasma physics, chemistry, medicine, all of which are really important. And at the bottom here, I, I have, oops, I have drawn, uh, I've, I've, I've stolen a picture from a website, I'm sorry, um, which, which is just a, a, a a plasma etching reactor in the semiconductor industry. And there you have high energy plasma, which generates electrons, it generates cations, it generates anions, and those go on to react with the silicon to make my, my, my semiconductors. It's also important in radiation chemistry. So if, if you go, next time you go to the dentist, what happens is you, you, you get a picture taken of your teeth with an X-ray, the X-ray is bad, but it's really not the X-ray that's bad. The X-ray goes through your head. Um, and what the X-ray does is it ionizes predominantly water because you're mostly made up of water. And those, that ionization event generates slow electrons and those electrons go on to react. And it's the electrons that actually do the biological damage. So Homer here will not be happy. Um, we can also, think of, of its importance in atmospheric chemistry. So I've, I've drawn here an example, a lightning bolt going through, through the sky. Of course, lots of energy is released, most of it in terms of electrons, and those go on to react with, with gas phase molecules. And then last but not least, well, there's some, a few more, but, but one of the most important ones is of course, astrochemistry. So, so the universe, the visible universe at least, is 99.99%, something like that, made of plasma. So everything is ionized in, in, in the visible universe. So there's, there's, there's lots of cations, lots of anions, lots of electrons, and they all must react together. So this question of, of how does an anion form is actually very central to what goes on in, in the interstellar medium. And, and that takes me to a little bit of a side point. Um, and that is that re science really relies on technology and of course on theory. And I will say something about theory in a minute, but technology is very, very part, uh, important. The way Lars drew this, this, this circle between um, experiment and theory, it's absolutely true. And it, along the side of that is of course, a, a similar circle with um, science and technology and all four feed into each other in some way. And so just as an example, much of modern scientific instrument uh, interest is, is dominated by photochemistry. We've heard a few talks um, just now um, but, but actually, if you look at, at scientific publications, there's so much to do with photochemistry. One of the very big reasons for this is that light technology is actually extremely ad advanced. And so to do photochemistry is, is um, I'm not going to say easy, none of this is easy, but it's, it, it's a very good place to start because you can understand so much, predominantly because the technology there. So often we do the science that we can do not what, what, what I would like to do, of course, is address this question of how do I make an anion? And for this, I don't have the technology. But what turns out to be quite useful is that even though my technology might not yet exist, I can still use existing technology, but we just have to think a little bit harder of how we would do the experiment. And so let me go back to, 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 to my initial question, how does an anion form? And I had this picture of, I make some excited state molecule, which is an anion. And my question was, well, once I've made this, once I've attached an electron here, how do I get back down to the ground state? And I've said, well, I cannot make short electron pulses, but of course I can, I can use a different trick and I can use the fact that light technology is so advanced. And so rather than looking at this process downwards, let me start off from my molecular anion. And what I will do is I will throw light at my molecular anion. And when I do this, actually I get to the exact same starting point as my electron molecule reaction. This is the thing that I'd like to study, this thing here, because the, what I want to ask myself is how do I get from there down to there? So with light, I can now excite that exact same thing. And from there, my reaction progresses. So I have my, my initially excited anion, and then it could fall apart to products. And so what I can do now spectroscopically is I can excite this initial thing that I'm interested in, and then using light again, I can probe the process of my reaction in the same way as I would do a, a pump probe um, experiment. But of course, the nice thing is that I've cheated because I'm using 
um, light instead of electrons, but I really am probing the electron molecule reaction. And so I just wanted to give an example of um, a simple problem in science that actually turns out to be really quite difficult to, to solve. And it turns out that there's actually a, a lot of very, what appear to be on the surface, simple problems that remain in science. And often because we have no good way of looking at it, we don't look at it. And so I have my three monkeys here, right? If I can't see it, I don't have to hear about it and I don't have to talk about it. But that doesn't mean that, that these problems aren't important. Um, and before I close, I, I do also want to say that as part of all of the, the, these types of experiments, theory is absolutely central to it all. Because what the experimentalists do is we measure stuff. And usually, as, as Lars and Helen have shown you, you measure a spectrum. And often these spectra are quite blobby things. And to try and understand what they actually mean, we actually rely very heavily on, on, on the theoreticians. And as Lars explained, it's a nice feedback loop because the theory informs experiment and experiment drives the theory. And so this loop goes on and on and on. And with that, I am pretty much finished. I would just like to say my thanks to all the people in my group that have done the work towards this. Um, and especially Anastasia for, for her theoretical help with some of this work too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Anastasia, do you want to add something again? I just want to thank my collaborators and uh, for really fun to have this um, joint project, but also for agreeing to participate in this round table and give the presentations. Thank you so much. I also very thankful to all. So uh, we, I think that uh, we still have some time for, for questions. I don't know what is the mechanism uh, for, for asking the questions. Should they appear in, in the chat or? Uh, in the chat, there are no questions. Um. But I don't know, maybe we can just open the discussion between us. Yeah, sure. That's a good point. Maybe someone has a question. <laughs> I'm wondering yeah, that have a... at least the chemistry department, uh, it's had to be not uh, like um, uh, a tradition to have the, the group uh, that is making some uh, uh, computational chemistry we have 16 research divisions and each research division have at least one group or a lab that goes in for computational chemistry uh, to calculate very different things from photochemistry that uh, we were discussing today up to biomolecules. Uh, so up to different interfacial phenomena. And this also includes some neural networks uh, that are developed, uh, for example, uh, for some to solve some technological aspects, for example, interfacial phenomena in the solvent-solvent extraction. So, uh, so it's thought to be very normal again that each each uh, different division have group or lab that, that goes in for computational chemistry. I think that the same the same is in in your universities. Yeah, Anastasia, maybe you can. Um, okay, maybe I can just uh, open the discussion with yeah. some questions. Helen, uh, what do you think about the perspective of doing protein stuff with the photo electron spectroscopy? Just making it more difficult. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it will make it more difficult. Um, but we did um, about a year or so ago, we did uh, as, a, as a quick try, see if we can put some um, GFP in our jet, but I made the mistake of telling my uh, collaborator who was expressing this stuff after I ex first of all explained that I needed 20 mils of protein. <laughs> Once I got my 20 mils of protein after much complaining, because um, that's quite a lot of protein to make, it turns out. Um, they thought I said, oh, it's just a quick experiment to see if it works. So you don't need to do anything that's really, really pure. So um, 
we, we put this, what we thought was GFP in our uh, jet and we fired light out of it. And uh, it, well, it made a nice, beautiful green car. <laughs> um, and then we, it, it, it was a mess that the spectrum, we just saw electrons everywhere. And then we ran a UV vis of it afterwards and found out that um, it hadn't been purified at all. But, but, the, but the point is, I think we can flow it through um, the, the jet. Um, when the protein comes out, it cools a bit. And when we catch the, the, the liquid, we heat it up a bit. So as long as we're careful with the temperatures not to ruin our protein, I think, um, I think there are exciting prospects for this. And we definitely expect to be able to put the enzyme for the bioluminescence in there as well. So I, I think it should be very exciting to, to do this science. Yeah. And Lars, what about you? I think you already did some experiments with the proteins. Yeah, not not in the, not in my group. Yeah, we did uh, we did some measurements, but not not uh, not in the not in the storage ring. Uh, that we would love to do that. I mean, the problem is that uh, a single photon being absorbed by a whole protein does not provide much uh, much heat uh, or much uh, temperature increase, uh, and hence not much response. I mean the the heat reservoir is too big for a protein. So, but if you can work with the anion case where if you can uh, somehow knock off an electron and neutralize, uh, change charge state and so on, then there, there may be a hope. So, but we, uh, we, we haven't been there yet, but uh, uh, that's not to say that we don't want to go that way. So how the method is sensitive, how many uh, material do you need? We, we, <laughs> we need uh, very little. Uh, we use the electrospray ionization method. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so you know, in in the in in the storage ring, I mean, we have maybe a million uh, molecules at a time, and a million molecules is not very much compared to Avogadro's number. <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah, uh, so it's 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 not very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But but speaking, can I can I ask a question uh, to Helen? Maybe speaking yeah, about sure, uh, speaking about proteins and yeah, sure. and okay. First of all, you know, I, I was a bit surprised that you can you are now able to uh, calculate on an equal footing uh, the chromophore and the whole solvent uh, issue. You know, without as I understood it, with thousand molecules or atoms or so. Uh, Is it a question to me? Yeah, the, it turned out to be a question to you because I was <laughs> sidetracked in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, of course, there are special methods that we are developing. It's not that the um, water molecules, all water molecules are treated the same way. Right. No, it's just a wise way how we treat the water molecules. Yeah. But then the central part is treated at the very high level of theory. Sure, sure. That, that's what I thought, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so back to Helen then. You, you, uh, um, you said that it seems like you have now... Uh, the protein acts like a full water reservoir almost uh, in terms of you had the water levels matching the, the protein uh, levels. But, but if you look at the dielectric constant of GFP, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's probably four or five or so, and it's 80 in bulk water. So, 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 so can you, do you want to comment on that? Uh, uh, <laughs> I think GF, well, GFP floats, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, 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 I think it's, it's quite fascinating that the higher lying, the energy level structure of the higher lying states and the energy required to um, detach the electron from the chromophore in water is the same as to be able to detach it from the chromophore in the, well, the calculations of mm. being able to detach it from the chromophore in the protein. And so it's um, more like saying that a combination of all the electrostatic effects of the waters in the environment add up to be the same in terms of the energy level structure of the whole in electrostatic environment inside the protein pocket of the higher lying states, not of S1. I mean, I agree that's closer to the gas phase spectrum. But I don't have anything profound to say about <laughs> it. I mean, we will be looking for the time uh, uh, constant for forming solvated electrons as soon as we're back up and running again mm -hmm. in our new lab. Great. Uh, here is Sasha. I, I just wanted to ask you a question, everyone. Um, 
uh, how do you think uh, the pandemics and what we have been obviously painfully experiencing this year will affect uh, the international collaboration system? Uh, not necessarily in health sciences, um, but um, I mean overall. With uh, we have now disrupted travel, obviously exchange. Uh, maybe some of us who are more dependent on foreign postdocs are seeing effects of the uh, of the um, hiring and so on and so forth. But there might be some other um, effects. So, what do you think will happen with us as scientists in the short run and in the longer run? So who could answer Sasha's question? Well, I, I, I have a small comment that uh, in our case, almost all the international travels are canceled. And this has really affects greatly, for example, for, for my science, we have uh, collaboration with the SRF, European Synchrotron and Radiation Facility. And we win several beam times there for uh, some speciation of different stuff and they all cancel. So we can, we can do, so I'm as a nuclear chemist, I need to go there. So I cannot send them just by the, by, by the post. Uh, we, we can still do some, uh, some non-radioactive stuff by sending like cerium uh, compounds, but we cannot do anything with radioactive. So and this really greatly affects us because this is also linked to some, to some uh, uh, international projects uh, between uh, ASRF, between uh, Dresden, uh, and between us, and certainly it would affect the the uh, travel of postdocs. So we are still expecting that there would be a possibility for two postdocs in the early next year to 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 go there for for at least uh, half a year to work there. But I'm not very optimistic on that. In my case, I feel uh, that um, it affects the hiring, of course. Um, it's not that the hiring is completely blocked. We still um, recruit, like, for example, in the training program in cancer nanotechnology. So we recruit the class and I have people who are recruited. But um, even with them, I feel, well, they're going to come and I won't meet them in person. And when they start, uh, how that will happen. And in my own group, I just don't recruit people right now. Um, and if so, that decreases the flow of science um, in a way, because I will graduate students and postdocs, but I don't know how to start with, with those. We already are in contact. Um, continuing with Zoom is good. It's fine. But with the new ones, you need a lot of interaction yeah. and uh, it's hard to arrange in the Zoom. Absolutely. So that's my feeling. Yeah. It slowed down things. Uh, for example, uh, in Moscow State University, I had some proposals to do things with the, in particular using aerosols, as you remember, since, uh, since spring, I was saying that we should. And I couldn't convince over this Zoom uh, Russian manufacturers to start administering drugs uh, aerosols because it would be a much better idea to use uh, 5 epiravir instead of uh, oral, uh, where we know it's not terribly active and it's not uh, actually terribly safe. Uh, that's why it wasn't used for flu but um, to use it as aerosols, but you know, just they, I think lack of uh, personal push and appearance is affecting success. Yeah. Is is things became slower. Although some people think that everything is just terrific. They spend a lot of time working and, uh, and uh, maybe somebody feels uh, really better because nobody interrupts their work and they're just doing work. I, I don't know what, what the other colleagues think. So I, 
I, I completely agree that it feels a lot slower. And in, yeah. in the UK anyway, much of this is driven by the fact that um, because of social distancing, you can only have um, lab occupancy of maybe one or two students. And so it, it's really affected the students and the postdocs progress. I, I think from, from the academics progress, yes, it's, it, it's, it's obviously terrible, but I can imagine in a few years time, hopefully we'll be back to normal. But it's much more difficult, of course, for the, for the, the early research, early career researchers where, where their progress is really impacted. But, but on the other hand, the, the, it, there's also been remarkable, um, I wouldn't say upshots of it, but, but things that have happened inadvertently because of COVID, because we were all stuck at home for a long time. The, the, the amount of proposals that were written, for example, in our department, has something like doubled or tripled. Right? We, we, which we, we had more time to sit by ourselves and think. <laughs> right, which doesn't increase the pool of money available and which increases the competition, obviously. Yeah. Uh, I also wrote uh, much more proposals uh, than I would do in a normal year. And, and everybody did so. So I guess the strain is enormous on the, the grant process. But there have been some studies in the UK saying that this is particularly true for um, male academics. But um, there's been a huge drop off in female academics who have um, submitted proposals. Um, EPSRC have noticed it, our funding body, and also submissions of papers. Um, there's been a couple of studies on this. And um, so it's not just women, but you know, people who've got young children at home. I've got some colleagues who've got a, you know, a couple of very young preschool children. And when nurseries were closed, I don't know how they did any work. I mean, I had to spend two months doing homeschool for my then nine-year-old. I mean, it drove me mad. <laughs> yes. It yes. was very and unproductive an, it, for me. <laughs> that's very good. That's a very important point. I also read and um, uh, papers and research, not necessarily from Britain, maybe it was coming from Britain, that female uh, faculty are disproportionately negatively affected by the uh, by the COVID, and I can tell um, that uh, my wife is a faculty as well. So it's it's not easy, and uh, it's 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 harder uh, for uh, um, for certain groups and for female group. Uh, of course, I, we, we I, I, yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. Well, we don't know whether the vaccine will uh, help us, uh, will work. I'm sure several vaccines will be approved, um, even though uh, some uh, concerns about safety always exist. And, uh, um, and, and actually the manufacturers of vaccines in US are trying to uh, not slow that down, but take more cautious approach so they, make a, a declaration that it shouldn't be fussed and, uh, and it has to be safe. But we don't know when the normality will come. It's just a, it's a, just a matter of unknown. It's once in a hundred years. Lack of personal interaction is bad. Uh, you, you realize that conferences are important in person. Uh, because you just get together and many things are discussed uh, not in in the in the hall in the lecture hall but many things are discussed during a beer or uh, you know just uh, socializing and this is very important for science sometimes more important than, ju than just the talks sometimes yes uh, sometimes yes uh, speaking about the last Nobel Prize in CRISPR-Cas9 in chemistry, actually, um, if you remember, uh, if you read that, uh, but uh, the two Nobel winners, they met uh, over a coffee during a conference accidentally and just they started talking science and decided to collaborate. Um, and we all know that's the case.
Yeah. That's to the administrators, um, and, I, and I don't mean the administrators at the level of the dean, I mean the administrators so the, uh, on the level of the agencies and so on and so forth, uh, why going to conferences is so important. To us, it's clear, but to them, yeah. Uh, I also at some point sure. that uh, from my point of view, we will have also now separation of the science uh, based on the size. Like uh, if in your work, you have some multi-central uh, investigation, if you cannot proceed it in the way how you did it before. So, like uh, when you have a project for 10 different institutes in uh, five different countries, so it's not possible to continue. In no. Yeah, for me, it's hard. For example, I, I mentioned I had a project which I wanted to push through the clear idea at Moscow State University in Russia, but uh, it just doesn't happen. Uh, and before I would fly in and just talk people, energize, you know, convince, and I cannot do that, and that's uh, well, that's a disruption. But anyway, we'll 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 survive. <laughs> it's once in a hundred years. I think there's a question on the chat. Yes, a question oh. to Dr. Kabanov. What do you think about prospects of other ways of increasing solubility of poorly soluble drugs, polymorphs, for example? Oh, yes, all this is, uh, is very um, available, um, um, but I would say using the polym, the idea is that the polymorphs of different, of, of the drugs, of organic molecules, different polymorphs have different solubility. Um, and um, not only polymorph, uh, a typical way for um, to increase drug solubility would be just to have a salt form of the same drug and uh, that increases uh, the administration. Now, when you are talking about the extents of increase, which we really want to accomplish to have some of very poorly soluble agents to be injectable, for example, uh, remdesivir cannot go orally. It has to be injected. The reason it doesn't go orally because it has a first pass problem. It gets to the liver and very little of the drug gets to the system after that in the active form. So you have to inject it intravenously. When you think of the dose, you cannot achieve that solubility with the dose because you need to have five, at least five milligram per mil uh, solution. That's why people are using these cyclodextrins um, to do that. and. Um, while polymorphs is very helpful, um, but uh, it, it has limited um, uh, solubility. Interestingly, uh, one thing we started thinking about when you prepare the formulations, which has a solubilization enhancement, here the form of the original drug and the manufacturing process matters. So for example, if you want to produce a polymeric micelle formulation of a drug, um, then, um, and then it depends how you produce it. And so what is the starting material? And, um, and, 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 and that part of science is not very well um, researched as we um, realized. Uh, then um, using different polymorphs um, or different organic solvents as a kind of intermediate to dissolve the drug is important as well to prepare the formulation as part of the manufacturing. Yeah. Uh -huh. The question, uh, it's just the same question repeated second time. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there are any more questions? Okay, we are almost Two years on the air and uh, two uh, two hours. <laughs> oh, yeah, yes. oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good mistake. <laughs> <laughs> by now, by now the pandemic should be over. <laughs> yes. <laughs>
And I would like to thank all the speakers and I would like to thank everyone who participated in our roundtable discussion. And again, first of all, I would like to wish you all good health and to overcome all these um, challenges related to uh, coronavirus uh, spreading all over the countries. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, and you, you, you will be given a link to the to the recorded uh, uh, roundtable, so then you can share through the colleagues.